Did you know it is very hard to convince someone that you are from a certain land if you do not know the language of that land? I mean, you may be familiar with the layout of that land, but it becomes very hard to navigate without mastering the language at hand. So what makes us trustworthy to others as heaven's tour guides on earth? Well, as believers, we should be progressively learning the language of heaven from birth. We should know the intricacy of prayer while never losing the simplicity and intimacy of prayer. So where do we start with picking up this language? I'll tell you. The best place to start is by spending time with the interpreter, the one who mastered it and who left us a model on how to use it. Church, let us pick up the language that Jesus so perfectly put down on earth as it is in heaven. So good morning again, church. Yeah, we're going to jump right into the message. We're going to have communion at the end of this message. So it all tie in perfectly together with how we commune with God, which is a daily activity. But we're going to break bread and drink some juice as symbolism of what the Lord has done for us. So with that in mind and this statement coming at you, consider how the Lord Jesus went more readily to the cross of pain than we go to the throne of grace. I think I could pray out and with that statement alone, thinking about how Jesus went more readily with passion to the cross of pain than I go individually devotionally to the throne of grace. Because he went to the cross, I have access to approach his throne. When's the last time we actually went to that throne of grace? Now, I'm not talking about repetition in prayer. We're going to come to a conclusion out of the, what is called the Lord's Prayer this morning, which, side note, the Lord's Prayer is actually John 17. If you were to read John chapter 17, that's the Lord's Prayer. That's when Jesus actually prayed to the Father on behalf of himself. He prayed for his disciples. Then he prayed for the church. That entire chapter is the Lord's Prayer. But what we know is the Lord's Prayer, if you actually read it, it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's our prayer. Jesus laid out the format or the model of prayer and how we're to come to the Father in heaven. So that's what we're at, the language of heaven. I'm convinced that if we've all here today progressively learned the language of earth since birth, then how come we're not progressively learning the language of heaven if we're born again? Shouldn't the language from a child to an adult become more fluent? Isn't that how we learned? We began saying one word, then we strung together sentences, then we put together paragraphs. Now we're fluent in our language. Now if we're born again and we're a Christian, then we should be fluent in the language of heaven. So Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount. And all throughout that sermon, Jesus is trying to accomplish not only leveling the playing field of all mankind, but he's trying to get us to go away from outward demonstration to focus on inward devotion. You know why? Because inward devotion will have the right application for outward demonstration. So he talks about, hey, you might have heard said that you shouldn't murder. Of course. But I'm saying to you that even when you look upon somebody with anger in your heart, you've murdered them. You've heard you, you shouldn't commit adultery. Of course not. But I'm telling you, when you look upon that woman with lust in your heart, You've committed the act. Then he talked about giving. Do not give to be seen. Do not fast so that people can say, wow, you're so spiritual. And then he says, do not pray so that the eyes of men could see you. And then he lays out what is called the Lord's Prayer. But again, I am convinced this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is our prayer. So even if you have your Bible, cross out the Lord's Prayer over that. That's man's title. And consider this is your prayer. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, Jesus says, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. The word hypocrite, hypocrites, was actually a positive connotation. It was a title to a Greek actor back in the day. On stage, they would wear these giant masks. Of course, in the days before microphones and big screens, if you sat in the back of the amphitheater, how could you possibly hear or see what was going on on stage? Well, that's why they wore those giant masks. They were called Hippocrates. Of course, that term meant a mask wearer. And that transcended the stage, and people used it as a negative connotation to call people that were two-faced 
hypocrites. So when Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites, don't be like the mask wearers. They were the religious folk. They were actually the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they would actually, on their way to the synagogue, required to pray three times a day, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the twelfth hour. But on their way to the synagogue, it was as if they were so excited to get there that they could not wait to go through the doors. They would stop on the corner of the street and pronounce this giant prayer for everybody to see. And we would see that and would say, wow, that's admirable. That's bold. But Jesus says, no. Consider the motives of the heart. They only want to be seen by men. The question is, what are we doing? Not only praying, but living. What are we doing for the eyes of men? The proverb states, the fear of man that literally ensnares one, trips you up. Even in worship, in the midst of brothers and sisters in Christ, Christians, the body, the church, we fear each other's eyes. I can't have you see me with my hands up. God forbid. No, God allow. But you stop me from worshiping. I'm so worried about what you think. When I focus in on God, I don't care that your eyes may be watching me. I want to have communion with him because as we just sang, when I pray, he comes close. So you know what I put on the altar when I come into this church? I put myself. I put my, my own image. I put my shame. I put my reputation. I put it all there. I say, Lord, it's all yours. And what I'm left with is transparency before you. So I want to sing, even though I can't sing. And I want to praise. Because I want to live for the heart of God, not the eyes of men. And they were guilty back in the day and we're guilty today that we do things for the eyes of men. This is an amazing account, Daniel chapter 6. Previous to this, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, previous, a group of men, advisors to the king, who did not like Daniel because of the favor he had, went to the king and said, we suggest that you would sign a decree that no man can petition God or men except for you, king, for 30 days. Of course, they did that to set Daniel up. Now watch what happens in verse 10. This is remarkable. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day. There it is, three times. So there's nothing wrong with praying those three times, but let's see what he uses in that prayer that God would hear him. And he prayed and gave thanks before his God. Underline this if you're tracking Daniel 6, verse 10, the last part. As was his custom since early days. That is the most important part of that paragraph. Why? Because he didn't hear that the decree was signed and say, you know what, I'm going to go fight that decree. I'm all of a sudden going to stand up for my faith. No, it tells us he had always prayed three times a day. This was a daily devotion for him. He wasn't doing anything different. That's how important it is to start now. Because I'll tell you, there will be a gamut of Christians that rise up if Facebook, for example, literally said no more Christian language to be posted. You know how many people who had not posted Christian language prior would actually go online just to make a point? And I'm saying that is false. If you're not doing it, don't start doing it. But start today so that when that does come down, when this nation literally says you can no longer do it, you do what you've been doing. Does that make sense, church? Daniel, he was more concerned about being heard by God than he was about the eyes of men. And let me tell you, the eyes of men would actually cause a great consequence. So instead of going home and shutting his windows and kind of just praying in his safe place, Daniel would rather go to the lion's den than to stay safe in the fear of men. So you can live for the heart of God or you can live for the eyes of men, but you cannot do both. You must make a decision today. Which one will you live for? Verse 6, but you, when you pray, Jesus says, go into your room and when you have shut your door, Pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I love this. Translation, Jesus is saying, carry out your devotion privately so that the father's favor can carry you publicly. What good is it to be an outward success but an inward failure? Public performance without private obedience. In other words, Jesus is saying the complete contrast of standing on the corner of the street and praying 
is going to your home. That's all it meant. Didn't necessarily mean a certain location like your closet, even though the premise of the movie War Room was literally from this exact verse, that you would go to your secret place. It's just a place that you can get alone with God. That's why it's a secret. When you tell somebody a secret, you don't want anybody to know. When you go to your secret place, it's a place where God alone sees you and God alone hears you. Do you have a secret place? Is it on the ground next to your bed? Is it going into your room? Maybe a chair, maybe a table in your house in the morning. Nonetheless, it's spending time with the Father alone so that he can impress upon your heart what he has for you for the day. Jesus' challenge was to get alone with the Father in our secret place. Now, the secret place can even be a chamber in your heart. You're in public, you're at work, you're in a setting where you can't get alone, but you need to. I'm talking about having such a devoted heart in prayer, praying without ceasing, that you can go to the secret place in your heart in the middle of a conflict. I used to go out on general population movements, was going to the cafeteria, going to the big yard in prison, and on that movement, for whatever reason, out of hundreds of inmates, a supervisor always found it necessary to come into my face. Out of all the people standing in line, he'd come up to me and get this close and literally just spit in my face and degrade and try to humiliate me. And I would go to the secret place in my heart, and I would just pray for God's peace, but I would also pray for his soul. And it was in that moment where he could not get me out of my composure because I went to my secret place. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm saying you have to have a private devotion for a public application. Jesus did. He modeled it. This is the man of prayer. He offers us the manner of prayer. We go to him to say, how did he do it? Mark chapter 1, verse 35. People of the church hate this verse. You know why? Mark 1, 35. Now in the morning... Having risen a long time before daylight, Jesus went out to a secret place, solitary place, and there he prayed. That's exactly what it says, Mark 1, 35. If you go back a few verses, you'll find out in the evening, the day before, Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing. That's exhausting. He's dealing with the people at large, which meant it was probably a late night, which meant he was probably tired, which meant he probably deserved to sleep in. But Mark 1, 35 shows up and says, Now in the morning, having risen a long time before daylight, he went out to a solitary place and he prayed. The disciples say, Where's Jesus? He was over there, but we can't find him. They finally find him and they say, Jesus, the people are back. In other words, the popular demand of the day, the people's choice, is for you to go deal with them. And Jesus says, no, we must be going to the next village to preach because it's for this purpose I came. Now we get right to the next verse and we miss what just happened there. The word next town or village is the only time it's mentioned in the scriptures. When you literally find the meaning of that word, you will discover it is an unwalled village, which meant no wall, no protection, no identity, which meant you usually skip those type of towns. You go to the bigger city, but Jesus knew, yes, I know you want me to go over there, but because I prayed to my daddy this morning, he wants me to go over there. It made no sense, but because he stopped before he ran out the door to go to work, the Lord laid upon his heart the steps he was to take. That's how important setting apart time to pray so the Lord can come near Verse 7 through 8, and when you do pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Now, of course, again, I say this because it's the most common known title of what we're going to study this morning, the Lord's Prayer. Many people pray the Lord's Prayer. We hold hands in a group of a circle, at a meeting, at a church setting, what have you. Most people, church and unchurch, know the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. And it has become a vain repetition. It has become a recitation. It has become something I know by memory, but I fail to understand the truth of it intimately. What is Jesus saying here? He said, don't pray all these long prayers because your vocabulary is so eloquent. That's what the heathen does. And I said, wait, what, what does the heathen have to do with this? I thought he was talking about the, the Jewish religious elite. Well, I found out that the word heathen means pagan or Gentile. It's anybody that was a non-Jew. And I said, did they pray? And he said, yes, they did. They prayed to their multiple gods. 
and they would actually go into these ritualistic chants, believing that if it sounded eloquent, that God in heaven would hear it. And I said, isn't that like us? Don't we have prayers that we read and we think that as long as we're praying this saint's prayer, or I'm doing these rosaries, or I'm praying to Hail Mary, that's not prescribed in scripture, church. Nowhere, no way, no how will you find any of those prescriptions of prayer in scripture, which means they are not the truth, which means our prayers hit a ceiling, which means God doesn't hear them, which means we have to simplify our language of heaven, which means we have to learn it. Jesus lays it out for us. He basically says prayer is not about length. Prayer is about strength. Now, I'm not saying shirk the times where you pray long. I'm talking about praying strong. And I know there's some of you in here that are going through situations where you can't even find the right words to pray, and that's okay too. But as long as your heart's into it, the Holy Spirit intercedes, translates, and brings your exact request, even if you don't know what it is, to the Father in heaven. So when you pray, it is better to have a heart without words than to have words without heart. It's better to just have a heart. Even if you can't find the right word, just bring your heart. And you better believe God will translate the heart. I believe when we ritualize the purpose of prayer, we desensitize the power of prayer. So how are we to pray? Jesus says in verse 9, in this manner or by this pattern or let this be a model, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Underline our Father. We are going to discover there are several P's that run through this prayer. The first P is the person of prayer. It is our Father. When Jesus said this, he revolutionized the idea that God is a Father. Because at that point, people knew God as Elohim. The plural of majesty. This great God. Distant. Mighty. Terrible. Awesome. People knew him as El Shaddai. The almighty God. All powerful. Omnipotent. People knew him as Yahweh. The unspeakable one. You dare not utter his name. He is the I am that I am. So when Jesus said yes. All of those things. My father in heaven is all of those things. But you can actually relate to him. As if you're his child. We've been doing a mini series on Thursday nights. Literally talking about our childlike responsibility to the Father's sovereignty. And I, I, I started each message on Thursday night by saying this. When I think of God as creator, as Pete explained it, the God of the microscope, the God of the telescope, when I think of him as creator, it humbles me, it impacts me, it influences me, it drops me to my knees. Goodness gracious, what a great God. But when I think of him as a father, that influences him. That moves him. Any father in here already knows. When you see a child in need, you respond. Even if the child can't communicate what they need, you respond. When you see God as a father, you better believe he will respond to your need. Our father, we can relate to him. Verse 9, again, in this manner, therefore, pray our father in heaven. Right? The place of prayer. Underline in heaven. The person is our father the place is heaven. Now, what is it about heaven? Is heaven this distant place where we're disconnected from God? Well, heaven's above earth, so it's a perspective. It's God's throne literally in heaven on earth, which means he is sovereign over everything. But in a really unique way, it means it's not that he's foreign in heaven. It's that he's sovereign in heaven. Translation, everything, everything that you will ever go through God controls, period. When we say our Father, we can relate to him. When we say he's in heaven, we revere him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, underline, hallowed be your name. This is the program of prayer. This is the program of life, to be honest with you. The word hallowed is an ancient word, rarely used today, translated in the original language as sanctify your name, set apart your name, make your name holy. God has already made his name holy. He cannot do anything but 
he cannot contradict his name, which means he cannot contradict his nature, which means no matter what we do, God's name will always be sanctified and holy. When I recognize that and I pray that, I'm just saying, God, you are so holy, you are so perfect in spite of me. But even more so, when I take the name Christian, I'm saying that your name now in me needs to be sanctified. Your name in me needs to be made great. In other words, when you pray the prayer, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name in my life, you're saying, make much of yourself through me. Show the people around me, my family, my friends, my coworkers, my neighbors, and everybody in between. Show them how great you are through me, Lord. I'm telling you, that is a prayer that God will always answer. Jesus prayed that prayer. Watch what Jesus prayed. Literally, thinking about going to the cross, he's going over his thoughts verbally. He says in verse 27 of chapter 12 in John, John 12, 27, now my soul is troubled. Of course it would be. Fully God, fully man. Thinking about going to the agony of the cross, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? In other words, I can't even find the words. Should I say this? Father, save me from this hour? It's rhetoric. It's a rhetorical question. He's saying, should I pray that? And then what overrides that prayer is knowing his Father's will, which is this. No, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Should I pray, save me? No, for this purpose I came. Watch the prayer, verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Now you'll be hard-pressed to find many texts in the Holy Scriptures that have God's audible voice, the Father in heaven, audibly speaking down to earth, yet here it is. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. In other words, I've glorified it in you, son, and I'm gonna glorify it again because that is your will to be partnered with my will. And when you pray that prayer, you better believe God will answer that he will make much of himself through your life when you pray it, John Piper said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And prayer is a huge part of that equation. To be satisfied by God, I have to come to him. And when I come to him in prayer, he comes to me. And I find my satisfaction being full. And then in my life, his glorification becomes obvious. God has a desire to glorify himself in each person's life. And I'm not talking about just being on a stage and preaching. That, actually, that's probably a very small portion of God glorifying himself through a man or woman. What he wants to do is make much of himself in your everyday walks of life. When you go into a workplace, God says, I want to make much of myself, but you've got to have me in your heart. And you have me in your heart when you start your day with me in prayer. And it's a private devotion that I will bless you publicly we talked about the Father, that's the person of prayer. In heaven, that's the place of prayer. Hallowed be your name, that's the program of prayer. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the purpose of prayer. The program, make much of yourself, how do I do that? Pray for his kingdom to come. Now his kingdom came once in Christ. His kingdom will come again when Jesus returns. But in between there, we're to pray, your will be done. Your will be done in my life. And he says, my will's already written in heaven. In the scriptures, you will find God's written will. It is already fulfilled, established, done in heaven, which means when I'm calling up to heaven's will to come down and be in my life, I'm asking for God to bring heaven to earth. Now, I've heard people say, man, it's hard, man. I work with some hard people. I have a difficult boss. It's hard to be a Christian there. It's hard to bring the will of God down to earth, even though I know it's done in heaven. And I say, wow, that sounds a lot like prison. Wow, I know what that's like. But I had a different experience. Crazy. I was able to bring heaven's will and economy down to a dark earth. Amazing. Wow. Because when I partnered with God in the process, he allowed me to bring heaven's economy down to earth, which is the peace of God, which is the truth of Christ, which is the joy of the Lord. And all these things are in his will. When we say we can't do it, it's because we've not asked for his will to come down through us. Simple. Watch an entire housing unit literally change. Not because of me. I would have joined the darkness and had a great time with it. I watched the housing unit change because I said, Lord, make much of yourself through me. Your will be done on earth in my life right now. Not when I get out, right now. And I watched them use this vessel to bring his kingdom 
to the people around me. That is the purpose of prayer. The provision of prayer comes to us in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Of course, he uses the word daily to literally tell us how important time is. <laughs> he didn't say, give us this week our daily bread. Give us this month our daily bread. Give us this year our daily bread. You know why? Because if he did, we would only come to him that one time for the week or that one time for the month or that one time for the year. He says, no, you need me daily, and I want to provide for you daily. I want to give you your sustenance, your provision. You have to come to me for your daily bread. What is the daily bread? Well, back in the day, bread was cross-cultural. It was a staple. It literally was experienced by all types of people, from the pauper to the prince. Bread was a common use of communion and fellowship, to break bread. So when Jesus said, give us, and I love the plurality of this prayer, because not only am I praying personally for me, I'm praying by community for you. When I say give us this day our daily bread, I'm not only praying for me and my wife, my family, I'm praying for you, church, that God would provide in your life the daily bread. Now, what is the daily bread? Ultimately, the daily bread is Jesus. Didn't he say, I'm the bread of life? Didn't he say that? Which meant when I pray for my daily bread, I'm saying, Lord, feed me. And that's what we're going to do after this message today. We're going to feed on the body of Christ. We are going to be washed anew by the blood of Christ. That's communion. But even more specifically, bread is your material provision, physical provision. And yes, even when you reach into your pocket, financial provision. Don't we call money today, show me that bread? Yeah, God has all that figured out for you. How much money you should make, when he should give it to you, how he'll bless you, whether it's a lot, whether it's a little. God has it all figured out. Pray, give us this day our daily bread. Verse 12, this is the pardon of prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is probably the most important line in this prayer because if we don't get this line, God won't get our prayer. If we don't understand what is being said here, this is actually the translation. Father, forgive us to the same degree that we forgive others. Forgive me, Lord, to the same degree that I have a heart to forgive others. So the question is, how well do I forgive others? And that's how much God says he'll forgive me. That's pretty scary, because I know some people that are Christians, but they can't forgive. Well, I can't get over what's been done to me, man. If I forgive them, I'm cutting them loose. Exactly. You're cutting them loose so that the ties of bitterness and resentment can set you free. Translation, literally, the word forgive is release. So when you put it in there and release us, our debts, release me from my debt and give me the grace and the mercy, Lord, to release others from their debts. This is an amazing account only because Peter, he begins talking to Jesus, thinking that he is got forgiveness figured out. Watch this. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Then he asked, up to seven times? And I say, what's that number? I'll tell you. It was taught that you're to forgive somebody three times. After the third time, if they kept slighting you or sinning against you, you didn't have to forgive anymore. So when Peter anted up and said seven times, he's saying, aren't I holier than the three? How about seven? And Jesus says... I do not say to you up to seven times. Where'd you get that? I didn't say to you that just seven times is enough. I said 70 times seven. Now you can get a number if you times 70 times seven, but the point is it's a complete forgiveness. It means keep forgiven. It's infinite forgiveness. It's perpetual forgiveness. It means even if somebody keeps sinning against you, yes, you learn not to trust them. However, you forgive them. Therefore, Jesus tells a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. You know how much money this is? This is 60 million days of wage. 60 million days of work and wage. One denarii was one day's wage. This guy owed 60 million. It is impossible to pay that debt. That's the point. 
Jesus is using a huge amount, an astronomical amount to make a point. He's saying this guy owes the master 60 million days of wage. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had. And that payment be made. You see how serious this is? You got to be sold and everybody connected to you unless you could pay. The servant therefore fell down before him, humbled himself. Master, have patience with me. Forgive me and I will pay you all. See, it started with a contrite heart. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. He was moved with empathy. He released him and forgave him the debt. All that debt forgiven, go free. You would think he'd leave excited. You would think he would leave with a new beginning. You would think he would leave with a brand new perception on life. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, 100 days of wage. 60 million days of wage just canceled and somebody owes him a hundred days. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, you pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet, humbled himself, and begged him, same thing he did, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were grieved, and they came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. And until he should pay all his debt, he would remain. Verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Need, I, need anything be said from that? In other words, the Christian who says, God, forgive me for all I've done. Save me from eternity, but I can't forgive you for what you've done. That person will not be forgiven according to that truth. That's a hard one. We must, and I know it's hard, but you can't in your own strength forgive anyone. That's the point. The point is, God, through me, help forgive and cut yourself free. That's what forgiveness does. It sets somebody else free, but it sets you free. That's the pardon of prayer. Verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Do not lead us into temptation. The word temptation is also the word trial. It's also the word testing. In other words, temptation and testing are both types of trials. God allows trials. The devil will use a trial to tempt. A trial could be some form of prosperity or a type of adversity. The devil will use a trial to tempt, to get you to turn from God, to sin, to fall, to jack you up and mess you up, to get you literally disconnected from God. That's what a temptation is. Even a good blessing could be a temptation with the wrong state of heart. Yet God allows trials to test. And he uses the test to draw you closer to him. Can you define the word test so I can make sure I know it's a test? No, it doesn't make a difference. It does not make a difference. It's a trial. And God allows all types of trials, allows into life, not for you to say, wait, is this from the devil? Is this a temptation or is this a test? It doesn't matter. Trust that God is sovereign. How do we know this? Job. God said, hey, let me open the window of heaven real quick. Just so the church, the Christian, has no basis to debate or argue how sovereign I am. He opens the window of heaven and we see an encounter and it's the, the devil, a very real enemy who approaches him and says, hey, that guy Job, he's only praying and going to church because you blessed him. And God says, okay, test him. The devil says, I got something better. I'm going to tempt him. Now, through all he went through, at one point, Job quotes these words. He says, he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. In other words, God will allow trial to infuse your soul with gold. And that comes to the person who recognizes he's in control. Well, that rhymed. I'm going to repeat that. 
God infuses your soul with gold when you recognize that he's in control. How do you like that, Pastor Matt Stokes? <laughs> Didn't he challenge me last Sunday? Was I here for that? Yeah. Let me say this. Pastor Matt Stokes, you cannot rap with this. Not on this stage, maybe at Coastal Kids. So with the protection of prayer and we pray, Lord, do not lead me into that temptation or that testing, I'm basically saying I'm too weak and I will fail. It's just complete submission of humility. It's basically saying, Lord, I need your strength. Imagine the opposite when we say, I can take this test. And the pride comes before the fall. The devil is on the prowl, so we must pray. The next part is Deliver us from the evil one. A very real enemy is out there trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Very real. And when's the last time we actually prayed, Father in heaven, deliver me, my family, my community from the grip of the evil one. And it's a plural prayer. Remember, so I'm praying it for me, but I'm also praying it for you. This is a huge part of prayer. Actually, remember... I told this story a very long time ago, but it's very powerful. And I'm yelling out the guard prison gate to get his attention. And I would call my unit number to East, which meant I needed him to come let me out. I'm either going on a movement to the medical, to a program. I'm on an agenda. So he would check the agenda. Mayor's on there. He'd open the gate and off I would go. But sometimes it took a lot of time to get their attention for whatever reason. So you'd yell to East. Now on this day, as I yell that, there was an older inmate behind me. His nickname was Pop. And Pop was yelling belligerently down the housing unit. So his yell was actually kind of over clouding my yell. So I very calmly and respectfully, I turned to him. I said, Pop, excuse me. Let me just grab the guard real quick. Then you can continue. It was very smooth. And I turned to east. Guard comes, opens gate, lets me go. Now in that meantime, a non-related situation. Non-related because I was linked up with Jason Williams, a former NBA All-Star in the 1990s, six foot eleven. Him and I were locked up together. We started a Bible study. We began to influence our housing unit, bringing heaven down to earth, and people began to change their lives over. It was remarkable. People would actually stand in prayer, 38 men on a housing unit, 20 of us standing in prayer in a prison unit, praying to God. It was amazing to see. Well, one supervisor hated that, hated the influence we had, literally could not stand Jason or myself, and literally went to the warden and said, Mayor Williams have too much influence together. We need to separate them. So they chose me to move me upstairs to the worst housing unit in the prison, 7 East. All the gang members were upstairs. All the violent offenders were upstairs. On that housing unit, that's the unit that I actually met John, little John, Palladino. That's a whole separate story. But when I got up there, I'll never forget it. An officer came up to me about two days later. He said, Mayor, come here. I went to the gate. Yes, sir. He said, do you have an altercation with Pop? I said, no. He says, are you sure? Can you think? I said, well, the one day I was at the gate, and I told him to kind of just be quiet because I was trying to get the officer's attention. He goes, well, we just locked him up. And we found a shank, a man-made knife in his locker. And when questioned, he told us, Bluntly, he was going to put it in you because you disrespected him. I can't even explain to you how ghosted I was. What? Completely unaware that that could have went down. But I am convinced that my mom and there were people in my life that were praying, protect him from the evil one. And though I thought that move upstairs was something bad, God said, I got it all figured out. You think sometimes a closed door or a dead end is something bad? Where were you, God? And God says, you don't even know what I protected you from. God does not play checkers. God plays chess. And there's something in chess called a negative succession, which means you'll lose a pawn to advance another move. And sometimes God says, I got to take you backwards. Just trust me because I'm keeping you from something over here or I want to bless you like a slingshot going back before I could propel you forward. Finally, this is the praise of prayer. Verse 13, this is how you end 
For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Yours is the kingdom and you are the king. It is all yours, the power, the Holy Spirit within me and the glory that your name would be renowned and famous and known. It's ending with a form of praise. It's an exclamation point on everything you already prayed. And then finally, verse 13, that one word, which is so often overlooked and overused, and it's simply amen. And the preacher says something that you agree with and you say, Amen. And the word amen means so be it, which means I not only agree with it, I'm actually going to go do it. But I fear, and I know, because I used to be that person, that would say amen, but not go do it. So at the end of each prayer, it's like filling out an application online. You fill out all your information, all the questions, and you literally get to that one button at the bottom. And that button says, submit. Amen means submit. It means release the prayer. Don't take it back. Let him handle it. Because if you take it back, he can't put his hand on it. Submit. Submission doesn't mean there is no more conversation with the Lord, however. Submission means that you leave the conclusion to the Lord. Because though you pray without ceasing, when you say amen, you are saying, Lord, the conclusion is now in your hands. So I reiterate, because Jesus went willingly to the cross of pain, we can come readily to the throne of grace. And seeing how from birth we have progressively learned the language of earth, likewise, if we are born again, we should be progressively learning the language of heaven. And since we're not dead, we are not done. We've heard it. Let us do it. God bless. Good morning, church. We're going to move into a time of communion right now. And as the ushers are passing out the elements, we're going to prepare our hearts. And I don't know anyone here, I don't know if this is maybe your first time taking communion or maybe you've taken communion many times. But I pray that you know how special it is. As Matt Mayer said in the message, it is daily communion with the Lord. When we say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just once a month. It's not just at a special service. But communion with the Lord is daily. And when we take the cup and we take the bread, we do this in remembrance. So interestingly enough, um, at youth group recently, we've been talking about friendship. Maybe some of you know uh, the verses, uh, there is one that sticks closer than a brother. That Jesus is this amazing friend. So then we had small groups and we're talking about songs that deal with friends and the song came up, what a friend we have in Jesus. I really enjoy